Hello, Christo. Good to see you here. Sounds like you're, uh, you got your final preparations in the sanctuary on September 5th. Boy, that's cutting it close. Yeah. <laughs> Rosh, Rosh Hashanah is, what is it? Is it the 6th at night? Is that when it is this year? Uh, or maybe yeah, the 7th. I think it is the 6th. Um, yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah it's the sixth. That now night. you're catching me out, aren't you? You're testing me. No, testing sorry. Me. I didn't know this was going to be, I didn't know this is going to be an exam already. <laughs> no, sorry about that. No, it's the sixth, right. Era of Rosh Hashanah is the sixth, Monday night, the sixth. So final prep on uh, Sunday. Yeah, I have a sense that, um, again, we're all feeling a bit caught off guard. I don't know if you, if you have that, the same thing across the pond. I, I have this feeling yeah. that a lot of people are just feeling... Again, sort of caught off guard by by everything. Well, don't we? We all every year we either say, uh, you know, it's like the high holy days are early this year, or the high holy days are late. But you know, right. as you know, they're never they're never they're never early on late. They're always at the same time. But it just always That's feels right. that way. But this year, because it's really early in September, it is relatively early, and so it feels like an early one. Um, yeah. But um, I but think I think we're also it, it, it's not I think just. We all st- yeah, I was just gonna say it's not just the timing. It it's also we. I think we were all expecting something different than than what we're getting. That was exactly my my where I was going with it as well. You know, we sat there for uh, we we went through the whole of five seven eight one, thinking you know here we're gonna go. Mm-hmm. This is it. Well, it's only gonna be one off. You know, five, seven, eight, two is around the corner and we're going to be back to normal. Yep. We spent the whole of last year saying it's only going to be a one off. It's only a one off. We're not going to be doing this in a year's time. It's all going to be fine. And um, I don't think I actually ever believed it definitely was going to be fine or oh, back to normal, if whatever normal is. Um, but it's just suddenly you're sitting there going, oh, it's back. It's back how we thought it was going to be. Uh, or yeah. in some cases it is. Um, we've got a slightly different situation in the UK than I think you have where you are. Um, we've got the majority of synagogues are back, um, be it that they are on, some are in limited numbers. Uh, some of them are uh, taking a different approach uh, to the, the government have said we can do what we like to, to a greater or lesser extent. Um, but I think there's still going to be a natural um, concern by people whether they should or shouldn't be back in the shul. Am I right that that you all seem to be a few weeks ahead of us in in the the pen in the, how the pandemic is going? Mm. Is that depends I know Israel what you call ahead of where where? Well, yeah, I, I mean, we I think I think we have, from my understanding, we've vaccinated faster maybe whatever you want to call that yeah um and maybe we're by the way is selwyn is selwyn a relative of yours he happens to be my father we had your mother watching last week so now hey we've got my father watching this week that's lovely so, uh, yeah, hi that's, selwyn uh, it's that's, so good that's to good. see you that's good it's uh, you, you wouldn't believe there's a family uh involvement in it <laughs> anything jewish there'll be a family involvement so there you go um but yes uh whether we're in a different place as in we have a different outcome i don't know we're just on a different point of a curve at the moment so let's just see where that takes us yeah yeah i think i I, um i'm not sure like you if i ever if i thought for sure that we would be coming back but i i definitely did not plan appropriately that is to say i i think i without thinking assumed that we would be back on site. Um, I don't think I doubted that we would need to provide for a hybrid experience or an online experience, but I'm not sure that yeah. it would, I, I don't think that I expect it to take as much energy as it's now taking for a lot of people. I, I'll just say that, you know, in a few of the Facebook groups, there's there are people asking now still, how many of it, there there are so many synagogues that still haven't decided can we be online only are we going to do um a hybrid experience there, there's still i think so many communities that just don't know what they should be doing at this point and i i heard one rabbi say actually the other day that she and i i i'm 
in the same boat as her. She doesn't ma- she, it doesn't matter to her what the decision is. Let's just make a decision just so that we can. Yeah, I've heard this. I've heard this a lot coming from my friends in America that you've we, we were very clear last year. We made some really outward decisions way, way, way in, uh, you know, middle of the summer. This is what we're going to be doing. This is where we're going. Um, so for the synagogues that I worked for, I had everyone that I had agreed to. We had set up, configured, everything was up and running. We were four or five weekends out uh, before, you know, before it came. This year, everybody's been the ones that didn't do the transition last year are still thinking. And actually today, this morning or this, this evening, actually late, a computer arrived, which is going to be, you can't see it, sloth shot. Um, has arrived for one show, uh, which is going to be their streaming server arrived today. Um, it's super late. It's super late. Yeah. I've got to get that in. Um, we we got Shlikot this weekend. We've got one Shabbat between then and the uh, High Holy Days. It's, it's going to be super tough. And I think... Um, I, th- I almost feel like it's that people are going in with they were just so holding out for something else and feeling like we didn't have to do this we wanted to be back um, we wanted all of our members back and it, it's going to be hard to to celebrate effectively new year with that sort of feeling like well we didn't really want to celebrate it this way and right. i you know and i was talking to you before or earlier you know, I think, as you were saying, the worst bit is going to be right at the very end. It's Simchat Torah. How, how, yeah. How's that going to be for you, David? How do you do, right, how do you do um, uh, Ushpizin, right? The welcoming of guests into your sukkah and dancing on Simchat Torah. I, I, the, the answer is, how is it going to be? Is I, I really don't know. Um, I, I, um, I, don't, I don't know. I, 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 bottom line, honestly, I think it's going to suck. I just, I really do. I think it's going to be terrible for another year. Uh, you know, we'll come up with some creative thing to do, which will not feel, I don't know. It, you know, part of the problem is that we've all grown up with our own experiences and we yearn for those. There's something about as much as I love change and growth and new, there's something so powerful about um, coming back in the sanctuary that we grew up in or with the, hearing the tunes that we grew up with or the experiences that we shared on Simchat Torah, going back to those experiences in the same way, even if they're old, yeah. they're out of date, the comfort that, that we get from that. And for, you know, for me on Simchat Torah, I, 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 gosh, I was living in St. Louis, Missouri, and it was you know this crazy dancing. They shut down the road we all were outside dancing and then I, I'll never forget the caramel apple uh, on the top of the flag because I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, back then I thought it was because it was a sweet new year. Apparently it was because we would poke people with the, with the flags. So they put the <laughs> yeah, apple yeah. on top to yeah. protect everyone. But it's, I, I think that the, the experience itself will perhaps be less than, but more painful for me is the um is how difficult it's going to be to bring those memories back uh, and to so create those memories l- let me ask you david because i've never explored this with you you know how how many years have you been a rabbi oh gosh uh 20 20 years 20 ordained years. ordained 20 so, years ago yeah ordained 20 years ago so uh, and you did you grow up in a, a rabbinic family or not <laughs> no, not at all. We were a typical conservative family. So in America, what that means yeah. is we kept strictly kosher in the house, but I could eat whatever I wanted out of the house. Two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, and a sesame seed bun from McDonald's every Saturday night. You have to do it under three seconds. Under three uh-huh. seconds. Three it's like, it's like uh, the, uh, the, what do you call it? The sons, uh, Heyman's sons I had to do in less than 10 seconds. Yeah. Um, we went to Shoal when there was a good kiddish. Um, you know, but, but uh, no, I definitely not a rabbinic family. So you then spent the time going through being ordained now having, as you said, 
18 plus years of doing you know really it it's like you fix your life around a calendar that has yeah. got some real meaning um and some real high points and some real life points i mean talking about the high holy days to me you know Col Nidre is has always been one of the most moving high points to me just listening to the music on Col Nidre is just something you know and for other reasons Yisko is very important to me as well as it is for many many people out there um and you're just sitting there going it just doesn't feel like that in the room so you must right. you know for you sitting there or standing there as as you have done uh, davening to this how does that you know you must be sitting there going when when do you start or when when you had a pulpit when did you start thinking about your um your what you were going to be doing as your sermons for for the high holy days yeah um for me personally i would usually start thinking about it a month or two ahead of time um you know what one of the interesting things about leading davening is that people who are leading especially on days like Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, people who are leading oftentimes forget themselves to pray, I find. Yeah. I, you know what? I'll just speak for myself. There were many times when I forgot to pray. I was so busy yeah. leading that I never... And what I discovered in my short career thus far is that the only authentic experience that I can give to my congregants is for me to authentically pray and that I do my yeah. best leading when I'm doing my best davening. That challenge is compounded tenfold now because on top of just davening and being aware of what page I'm calling and being aware of the people in the room, now I have to look at a chat window, right? Yeah. I, have to, I, I, I have to be aware of my microphone placement. I, I mean, it... And, and it's so important for leaders to not forget why they're there. They are yeah. not there to be technical folks. They're not there to be streamers. They're there to, to daven and to inspire and to lead. All of this stuff is important and they should have qualified, skilled people to do it. But if we ourselves get too bound up in that, I feel like we have no chance of providing a, a meaningful experience ever. And, and that must be really tough, as you say, because um, in all that time of all your teaching and of all the, your, the, the education that you went through yourself and now since that, you've had sort of like a set of rails to say, this is what we're going to do yeah. at this time. This is how we're going to do here. Yeah. This is the thing. This is what you need to do. These are the bit things you need to bring to the room, etc., etc. And suddenly you're going, I'm not even in the room I was actually planning to be in. I'm staring at a computer. The one thing probably in your conservative upbringing that you went, uh, you're not supposed to be playing with that right. during that. And you're now right. sitting there going, right. everything is 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 turned itself on its head and it's so like, i gotta tell you though leo yeah. to, that that to me is what's so exciting about this moment because we you, you said before go back to normal whatever that means yeah normal was sort of terrible i i mean i mean now now granted i get okay, paid so what did you think it meant to people in the pews like me so exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly i mean i was just gonna say i get paid to pray like i get paid to show up at synagogue and it was painful for me the the, the you know there's a reason and again you'll have to tell me if this is true in the uk but there's a reason why the numbers of participants of people who are engaging in meaningful jewish experiences in the context of synagogues or Jewish organizations, there's a reason why that number is just plummeting. It's because we're not offering something that is compelling. We're not, or we're not, no, let me change that. We're not offering something that is very compelling in an incredibly compelling way. Our, our, for whatever reason, what, people, what we are offering is not being received in the way that we think it, in the way that we are offering it. And so, I actually think that in this moment, when, as you said, even the most basic things are just torn away from us, that, thank goodness for that. Because now, finally, maybe, we will begin to embrace 
the, the power of, of change and that some of this is really important. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, and I'm looking at Christo's comment here and it, I think it's an absolutely bang on comment. It's like why I managed to Zoom part of the service, less for my rabbi and other key lay leaders to deal with. Absolutely, you've suddenly got a need for a different set of skills yeah. and a potentially a different set of people. And I always find this, um, I was thinking this over about something else that, 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 you know, when you get a different person running an organization or a different person leading an environment, um, the natural inclination of the person who's leading before is to say, no, 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 I'll do it my way and I'm going to show you my way. And then you get somebody else who does it completely differently. And if you can have that opportunity to step back and watch, as a leader, you can actually see differences. You can see maybe it's maybe it's better, maybe it's not. But in, invariably, when you look at new ways of bringing things in and different people with different experiences, it changes the dynamics of what happened. So I look back and I look at something like, you know, where I am, um, in I'm in liberal Judaism in the UK, which is... Um, uh, related into the reform in the in the US. And I look at when they brought in music and I look at when we brought in uh, music on guitars and how that radically changed the approach to uh, bringing bringing a service and a community and a connection to people because people could relate to something and suddenly you're starting to see a different experience and i, I you know i know you're 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 a rabbi that plays the guitar uh, along with many that are out there now um i'm sure which, which came first for you was it the guitar <laughs> well, or the rabbi uh um guitar by a hair so I was, but they're, but okay. they're connected. They're connected. So I was at, I was, I, I was at a, uh, such an embarrassing story. I was at a USY convention. That's great. USY, we want this. Yeah, I know. USY is the conservative movement's youth group. I was at a USY convention and I was, I didn't know anything about computers or technology, but I was a geek from, from the, from the get go. And, um, there was this guy whose name I know, but he'll remain nameless, who was, um, balding and heavy and he was an advisor at this convention and he played guitar and all the girls girls were hanging out by him and i said to myself i've got to learn that instrument so i went home i bought myself an ovation guitar and i watched eric clapton unplugged on my vhs uh, cassette and i learned i taught myself to play guitar I, I i got a lot of girls to follow me they were all seven and eight year, years old so i missed my dem my target demographic but um the music, I, in some ways, I guess the music certainly came before the rabbinate for me. And you're right that that is a hook that that allows people yeah. to feel connected. Um, it, one of the things that to me is really fascinating about the use of technology around in spiritual spaces. I'd love to hear what you think about this. Is that piece of connectedness? You know, you and I, uh, you far more than I, but are involved in, in office hours. And there's, uh, th yeah. which is a, for those of you who don't know, it's a week, a, a daily show. It happens every single day where you get to ask questions about streaming and technology and, and uh, virtual everything. Um, there is such a beautiful community and a sense of connectedness that has grown up around that experience. And none of us have ever met one another face to face it's all been online and yet I, I i think that in the in the jewish community there still is a sense that the connections aren't the same in digital space what what do you what, what's your sense about that can we make that's meaningful really, connections really, that's a really um interesting question and and it's actually something that runs through a lot of things that we do do you have a meaningful, you know, in some people, do they have a meaningful connection to the people they watch on TV? Do right. they have a meaningful connection to <laughs> the, and I just go back to it, and you, we were talked about this, about this, the, the pop stars they see on TV or the, they, they list the records they listen to. Do they have a meaningful connection? Do you have a meaningful, can you have a meaningful connection to Bob Dylan? And 
And does he resonate in what he says and his lyrics that he wrote? And you think, and I would say that you can. I think that actually it isn't necessarily being present. Present doesn't actually have to be physically face to face. I would say, and I mentioned it earlier, um, and why I like Cole Nidre. I have um, our, our music director at our synagogue that I go to, which is the Ark in Northwood. Uh, she's a cellist and she plays Cole Nidre and quite honestly, she plays it also with a viola. There's also um, a viola player at the same time. And the two of them, um, you know, I'm in the room, but I'm somewhere else. I'm somewhere else when I'm in the room when they're playing, because mm. although I'm physically there, you just, you're just hearing yourself upstairs in there because the music is so haunting. Big cavernous room. We, we, we normally used to go to Watford Coliseum, which is a, a world renowned music venue, which is where we used to, or we have always up until this last two years, have our high holy days. And you listen to them playing um, and also there's some component as well. And then, the, the, you know, the, the, we, you know, the whole choir is great. I'm not, you know, differently. You know, I'll end up saying thank you to everybody here. But the two of them, when they're playing Col Nidre, um, I don't know, you know, I, I, the, I am connected to the music that is being played. And I think the question, to answer your question, David, I think you can have meaningful connections to things which you aren't physically touching. And that's but the will point. You, but you, will you, can you have, you have that same to something you can't touch? But yeah. will you have that same connection if you're listening to them online as opposed to in the Coliseum? Um, yes, I think I will if it's played in a way. But I, I can, you know, when I listen to some things, um, I, on this Shabbat that's just gone by, our... Uh, uh, one of our rabbis, she gave a sermon about the situation in Afghanistan. And I'm sitting there listening to that while I'm at home and I'm listening to the sermon about Afghanistan and how you could hear it in her voice, her concern and fear for the women in Afghanistan and where that's going. And... Um, I'm connected to it. I'm connected to it. Absolutely. She moved me as much as she would have moved me if I was in the physical room. So mm. I think you can. I definitely think you can have that. I think yeah. there's some things you can't. Um, I think when I see pictures of the cartel and I see people at the cartel, it doesn't move me as much as being there. Right. Um, you know, yeah. And, and I, I think, think that, you know, going back to what, touch. and going back to what you asked before, for me, dancing on Simchat Torah, it just won't be the same as, as you know, doing it uh, uh, on site. And, and that's okay. I, no one, no one is, is advocate, or I, I shouldn't say no one. I certainly am not advocating for Judaism to end up, uh, you know, in, as a, for us all to be in a digital synagogue. That, that's not the goal here. The goal is how can we grab this moment and turn it from a, um, I've talked about this being a tircha, a burden, and, and it is, yeah. it's a burden, but is it, does it have to be a painful burden or can it be a joyful burden? Um, I, I just, I want to, Christo is just, this is such a beautiful comment. It was so much to handle managing the Zoom from the Bima a few weeks ago. That was challenging, but listen, but, but the people are worth it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, yes, and, and it's you. not just the people in the room it's the people in the zoom it's the people on youtube it's the it's it's our people wherever they are um this morning alex Lindsay, the the host of office hours was talking about you know one of his big things is digital first events and he he's convinced that the whole world eventually is going to move to digital first events and his, part of his argument is that if we don't from a business perspective we're cutting off 99% of our potential audience. As, as, as Jews, as synagogue leaders, as, as people who want to grow the Jewish community and Jewish engagement, if we don't embrace this moment 
and use whatever technologies are appropriate for us, we are cutting off, maybe not 99, but a large portion of our potential audience, and that's a terrible word to use. Yeah, and, and that's, and I'm gonna throw that back to you, David, and say, you, why are you doing this? Is that, do you, do you feel that you yeah. can make a change to that, that number of people that we are leaving at the wrong side of the Red Sea? It's a really good question. Um, why am I doing this? Uh, I'll tell you why I'm doing this. And this is, this answer will not resonate with a lot of people. Uh, but I'm a fixer. I like to fix things. I'm not a process guy. Uh, when there's a problem, I, I might not know how to fix it, but if I ask the right questions and if I search hard enough, I can usually find an answer and I can fix it. And to me, this, all of these questions that we're struggling with are fixable. There are answers for how can I get better Wi-Fi? How can I get better audio? How can I get better video? How, you know, how can I bring um, uh, visual tefillah in? These are all things that we can fix. And, and so it, I derive a tremendous amount of satisfaction from helping people fix those perceived problems. Um, before I was a rabbi, I was, actually, I was an EMT, an uh, emergency medical technician. And I, I made the move from being an EMT to a rabbi, although I always knew I was going to, but I really made that leap when it dawned on me that you can't fix every injury by bandaging it up and, and bringing them to the hospital. That some injuries are, go much deeper. And um, so by my nature, I'm a fixer. I like to fix things, I like to bandage things up. And this allows me to do that. And, and the reason I said it, it, it might not resonate with people is that I think for a lot of people, they don't see these problems or these challenges as fixable. I think they see them as overwhelming. And, um, and, and I, I, think I, I have a feeling you're gonna go to the starfish analogy any minute now. The starfish analogy? You must know the starfish analogy. What's this? I've heard it, but now I'm forgetting it. What's the starfish analogy? So, um, there's a little boy. There's a there's a tsunami and a load of starfish are on the on the on the on the on the sand. A little boy comes along. He picks up one and he's throwing them, and he's picking up another and he's throwing them into the water and throwing them into water, throwing them into the water. A guy comes along. And he said to him what are you doing? There's millions of starfish on here. What's the point? And he said, well, picks up one. He said, well, that one's fixed. Well, that one's helped. And that one's helped. And that right. one's helped. And the reality is with what you've just said there, David, is you can't, we can't fix all of this. And in fact, we are in, as it is literally said, a global pandemic. We're also in lots of other things. There's, you know, right. what, what's interesting is the new cycle. I feel like the new cycle has been on overdrive for the last five years, at least. It feels like we're in, we, we lurch from crisis to crisis to something that sounds even worse than where we were. But that doesn't mean to say we are necessarily heading for complete annihilation. We're just moving in a direction. And we also see at the same time, fixes and things being sorted out and, and some big issues that maybe we could have argued were un, touchable or we were putting to one side like black lives matter or me too have i wouldn't say fixed but they've at least been moved along a journey that even 10 years ago those issues were just being ignored so yeah. maybe those little starfish got uh, got fixed while some others didn't so you, you want to fix things <laughs> i do want to fix things I, I i also think that there this it, it, i I have been focused on the, I've been focused, excuse me, on the fixing, but I also think that there is a bigger picture and a larger opportunity. I talked a little bit about this on Tuesday, um, that uh, I get why 
we spend so much time focused on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, on the high holidays. I understand why we invest so much time and energy and money um, into last year and this year, the production of those um, services and those experiences. I also think it's a real shame because we are perpetuating this myth or this idea that those are the only important days. And one of the things that I've really wanted to encourage folks is don't just fix the high holidays. Think about, I guess it's, it's to a certain extent, it's still a bunch of starfish, but think about holistically, how are you reaching your folks? How, what do you, what does your synagogue, what is your Jewish community, what do you want it to look like in five years, in 10 years? You won't, I promise you, you won't be using the same technologies. We're gonna be using technologies in five and 10 years that we, that don't even exist today. But what do you want to, what, what, how do you want to be able to reach people? Do you want to be nimble enough and brave enough to try new things, to, um, uh, to, to be on the cutting edge, to use technologies to your, to your benefit instead of we have a big service coming up and so I'm going to hire a company to come in and, and do this work for me. I'm not knocking that because I know that's part of what you do, but I think we need to, we're not going to do that every Saturday. We're not going to hire a production company. So I think so that's, how that's, do we set I ourselves mean, up for success long term? Uh, absolutely. And, and I guess a classic example of this is what we've just seen at the moment and we're seeing at the moment with the Paralympics is the Olympics is a good example of, uh, oh, look, we've built everything for one big thing. And when you do build it for one big thing, and there's been quite a few examples in the press in the UK showing old Olympic uh, venues which are empty. I think the swimming pool, the last picture I saw, the swimming pool in Rio, which is only four or well, five years old, is empty at the moment. Maybe, I'm not sure it's exactly correct, but you know, it's that sort of thing. And so we build all these um, mega stadia, mega events, as you said, to support a very short term goal, this big thing at once a year, you know, and, and as you, you know, we, but, but to me, as you've said, and I agree with you here, David, that, um, I always say to people, it's small numbers and changes, uh, you know, people say, but we, there's no point in us streaming on Facebook because we only got 12 people on there. There's no point in streaming on uh, Twitter or on this platform or that platform. Cause you know, there was only six people. And I'm like, yeah, but that's six people more, you know, if you start putting them into right. squares, into the seats in your sanctuary and you sit there and you go, well, we've got six there, we've got 12 there, we've got another 11 here. Um, maybe that's not a massive number, but actually when you start adding it up and then they go, and then what ends up happening with all of these things is all of these outlining things like Twitter or whatever, they start watching here and then they come and watch you on there. And eventually if you're a, a synagogue that uses Zoom because of the connections, a lot of people then will say, well, we're going to Zoom. But they don't necessarily start there. You need to bring them in and, uh, you know, if I said to any synagogue, uh, well, if you open your doors and six new people walk past mm -hmm. and they will come in, I, I defy any synagogue, apart from maybe right. central, that will not be saying, get six more people in the door. You yeah. know, even they would actually. But, you know, it's like because we, we, want, we need to grow. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I, think, I think I talked about... Uh, about some of this last time about missionary things and last time, but you know, we, it is, there is a natural reality, particularly with an aging population, particularly as you said, with where we're going, that we need to ensure that these things move forward and we bring more people in. And if fixing them is the way we do it, the way you do it, you break a barrier down, which opens more people up, then you know, things are going to go. So with, you know, with the high holy days, literally around the corner, David, what is the thing that you feel if you're sitting there as a synagogue who's done nothing or is really worried, what would you be saying to them now? What, you know, this big, they've got this big mountain in front of them. What yeah. do they do to get those first few steps? I think I would say two things. 
I think I would start with um, just do it. I, regardless of the equipment that you have, I mean, I'm happy to, you know, any of us could share with you how to up your game when it comes to equipment, when it comes to audio or, or video or any of that. But regardless of that, just do it. Just make sure that you are as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. And the second thing I would say is, and I learned this actually from um, uh, Elevation Church, is Remember that 30% of, uh, uh, of online engagement is in the form of streaming. The other 70% is in looking at people's comments and reading them. I, Guy, were you at the StreamYard um, thing today at all? I was. I was at some of it, yeah. So I don't know if you saw Guy Vanderchuk's uh, um keynote. He, he gave a, a keynote speech. And one of the things that he was talking about is, is how, um, he, he's a media mogul yeah. and yeah. Um, and he said, uh, that he, re he replies, I don't know if he actually does it, but he replies to almost every comment on his videos. Yeah. I heard that. I heard that. He said yeah. the first 10,000 tweets that he received, he replied to. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And that that's how you build those connections. It's the streaming is important. The um, uh, getting the message out there, and I, I, I want to say also that that Christo says here, it's right. This is powerful. That if so, someone could see a, a live broadcast on Facebook, YouTube, and they really needed to hear what was said, and their life improves. Right? You never know what good can come. Absolutely, stream, stream, stream. Put it out there. The more important piece, I think, when it comes to engagement, when it comes to connection, when it comes to spiritual, nourishing spiritual growth, is making those connections, is engaging with people on chat, picking up the phone and calling them, or emailing them, or texting them, or what, right? However we can reach our online audiences in between the streams, that's what we need to do. I think that, that's so, what I would so say. So I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction, but very similar to that. Uh, my, my other life, I'm a, a season ticket holder at Watford Football Club. Um, we used to have our manager at Watford Football Club was a guy, Graham Taylor. I remember I said something. I can't remember what it was. It doesn't really matter. Um, he rang me up. So this is the head coach of the football club rang me up. And during the whole of the first lockdown, a member of the playing staff or a member of the management rang virtually every single one of their 15,000 season ticket holders. Wow. They rang them up. They just rang them up, said, how are you doing? I'm ringing from Watford Football Club. I hope you're well. We're looking forward to you coming back. Now, okay, somebody's probably sat there and done the numbers. It's probably not, you know, the, the, uh, with phone costs, etc. And it makes a huge difference. And the reality is, and you know this as well, you know, I, you know, when I moved house, the first people through the door here to, to, to sort of give me something was one of the rabbis. Yeah. And I, I just feel that that level of touch, and maybe it's digital, it's going to be digital over the next period of time. And the reason why a lot of synagogues will have Kiddush at the end and the Kiddush at the end is there for everybody to talk to. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the, one of the, um, uh, one of the, one of the team will actually sit there and reach out and ask everybody how they are. Um, it's there cause you need to do it because there's a lot of people who are sitting there at home and go, maybe they speak to the, you know, of a certain age, they'll talk to their relatives on a regular basis, but they, to hear a different voice ask them the same question and that they've got an answer 10 times, you know, you know my stepfather, I'll ask this, he'll tell me the same thing he's told me 12 times before. So will my father, yeah. but yeah. Um, they want to hear that from somebody else and it's great. And I think it's one of those, how do you write it down as one of the services we do on a piece of paper is this. And it's like, right. it isn't, it's an unwritten, service and i think it's even more so at this moment in time is that criticality of keeping in that communication keeping in touch and online it happens just as well and i think it's it, it, it's vital 
that what as you say you know it's this is why we're doing this or this is why you're doing it and this is why i'm doing it from a different perspective is to say to people i'm not looking at how many people are watching it's that's not really the point it's not saying well that was a failure because we didn't have 700 people it's saying well if it makes a difference to four people or three people or one person's watching it it makes a difference and there's right. a really good comment on there from uh uh daniel klingerman i don't know if you've got that one uh the one before that actually um and and he you know and he's as he's saying you know um we made a difference right i right. don't know if it was you or me it doesn't really matter one of the two of us yeah both of us. Can, right. can you can you address can you address his second um, post though? This isn't right. So I, I think a lot of synagogues are, are wrestling with this. Hybrid services on Zoom, it's working like a charm, but they need a live technician. Do you need a live technician to be successful in a in a hybrid or yeah. digital experience? I think you do. I think you do really. I think you do the same way as you have a shamus in the in your synagogue that will look after people, put them in the right seats, make sure they've got the right uh, books facing the right way up, uh, you know, and helping them when they need to go to the toilet and not smashing the door open and closed. You need them. Um, is it a difficult role? Not really now. I think a lot of people are now picked up and understand how to use Zoom to that level. Um, do you have to be super efficient and run a really complex version of like Zoom OB, uh, OSC and be able to spotlight people in four, 14 milliseconds? No, but I no. do think you need some level. You do need somebody to be able to mute out and control people. Um, control is maybe too big a word. It's gently push people and nudge so that the service can continue without the rabbis having to sit there and and flick on the buttons. I think that is, I think that's a vital role. And here's, and here's the beauty of being in digital space is that um, you don't need to be on site necessarily. So I was actually just having a conversation with our rabbi, the, the congregational rabbi here, and he was talking with me about slichot, about this experience he's doing for slichot. And he was asking me, okay, I want to have, we're, it's going to be hybrid, so we're going to have people in the room, and um, uh, we're, we're going to be using a, um, an owl camera, right? So we're going to have everyone sitting in a circle, put the owl camera in the middle, which is a really, it's not high quality, but it's a really nice solution for this kind of thing. Uh, and he wants to be able to put up s slides on the screen and in screen share. And he was asking me how to do this. And I, and I told him, I said, well, here's how you can do it. But the other option is just let me host the meeting and I'll, I'll just throw those slides up for you. No worries, no harm, no foul. And I can stay at home, <laughs> right? My office is an hour away from my home. So I can just, I can do it all from home. I actually, th this question about Zoom Gabbai's. As soon as I heard the term Zoom Gabbai, I immediately went out and I bought ZoomGabbai.com. So if anyone's interested, you can go to ZoomGabbai.com. But I, I, and I actually, I was calling them Torah Techies before Zoom Gabbai became a, a big thing. But I have thought about how can we create a cadre of people who can do this work from wherever they are? Because like you said, it's, does, it's not that complicated. Um, you need to just be good with Zoom and you have to have the right tools. You know, for some people that would be having two monitors, for other people it may be having a stream deck, um, or for other people it may just have a, a, an itchy clicker finger so that you can move around quickly. Um, but it, it, pairing up congregations that need that kind of support with people who might want to offer that as a service to the community. Um, I haven't really done anything with this yet, but uh, that, that I was, because it is a need, I, I think. And you're right that it's really important to have, Leo. And I think it's the same. I mean, when I set my own company up, and this is uh, going in this, you know, you'll, you'll see where I'm going here. One of the things that we did at the beginning, and a lot of companies do this when you're a small company, is, um, we would clean our own office because, uh, you know, it's, it's another few pounds to save, uh, in there, but then you realize that you are doing something that really there's people who are better at it. 
and there's people that you can get to do that job and you can pay them to do it and it, it, it frees you up from one other thing that you need to do and that's tiring you out and it's very similar i mean yes at the beginning of this lockdown in the uk and i'm sure it may be very similar that a lot of weight was put on the rabbis yeah. uh, to do everything to be doing this to, to launching the zoom it was their zoom set their zoom login launching the zoom starting it all doing the thing setting all set pulling everybody in the waiting room and then pushing everybody out and then doing all this and then everything and everything and everything um and i don't know what your high holy days was like last year but at the end of the high holy days last year for me and when i were where i was involved with my synagogue i think we all went home and slept <laughs> we just literally collapsed yeah. Um, yeah because it was so it was really really hard work and it was like and i remember speaking to one of my rabbis who was saying it was probably the hardest service they've ever done or the hardest days particularly yom kippur where you're just going and going and going and going and going um and it just feels like there's no there's nothing coming back and it's right. it's sort of like reciting something in front of an empty room and and it and it was it, it was hard work so i don't think we realize the more Leo, you can pass I, I, over. I, yeah. I don't think we realize what you just said is so important that um, davening or speaking to an empty room i don't think we realized how important it was for us as leaders to be able to see the people that that we so that we could have a congregation you know for those and this is why i've you can engage on youtube and facebook you absolutely can for me personally it is much better to be able to it is important for me to be able to see other faces and and so zoom has been or whatever you choose to use meet zoom you know what whatever microsoft i don't even teams um teams, any yeah. any any of them are fine but having now i hope rabbis cantors educators have monitors so they can see those faces so they can know that they're they're not speaking as john oliver's you know into the void that that they're actually human beings that are with them, even though it's not in the same physical space. Yeah, and I think the comments that you watch and you see, so we're, you know, I'm sitting here with, I look over here because I've got the chat window coming up and, you know, we're seeing the comments that are coming in and the, and, and the, the feeling that you're actually engaging with people wherever they are and you're touching and you're helping, I think is, is vital because um, you know, I, you know, I spent a really long time as a leading, I was a, a, a Cub Scout leader and I was involved in that and the Scout, Scout Association for a huge amount of time. And I always used to, and one of the things that was one of the best things I always remember is I turned around um, at a meeting and I said, I'm going to read out the list of, I'm going to read this list out. And I read out the list of all of the explorers and the universities they went to. And every single one of those explorers was, or literally every single one of them was, were, were my cubs. So cubs, they finished at 10. They went all the way through. And I'm like, they all went to university. Now, I'm not saying that they all went to university just because of me. Hmm. Oh, but I know that I had an influence that has made those, those young people to a different degree than possibly they could have achieved yeah. without. And to be able to get the feedback, and the same with this, to be able to get that feedback and to know where they're going and to feel that you've put somebody on a journey to somewhere and that you've, just, you've moved them into a, improved their opportunities. And I think that's always the case. And I do think that religion, and I do think there's a lot to be said about Judaism that can improve people's opportunities. It's not saying that it's going to change, people can't change what they do in some ways, but it will give them the opportunities. And I hope that's the way it works. And that's why I'm really supportive, particularly of like the youth movement side, that we can improve it. And if we can do that, and we can make it better and we can help people on this journey, then, then maybe maybe it's been worth it. Yeah. And, and the comments coming back 
to me and to you and the people that are saying things just to me is like that helps to know that we aren't just I'm just not talking to a wall. Right. And by the way, I'll tell you from the other side, um, I'm, I'm part of the, uh, the Ecamm. Ecamm is what we, I use to produce all this stuff. And, and I'm uh, very active in the Facebook group and on YouTube. And I watch a lot of the streams. And I, I'm not ashamed to say that I love hearing the person on YouTube say my name. And I love when they acknowledge my comment. It, it, because again, it allow, it make, it, it makes it so that it matters that I'm there. And I think that at a certain point, religion or not, everybody wants to know that it matters that they're there. It, they matter. And so there is a really good segue to why YISCOR is so important. Because to me, YISCOR is so important because you're now, you know, you know, it's sad. Of course it is, but it's also really important to me when I've had relatives names called out, um, because you're actually saying I'm standing there because they were there before me and it's really super important and seeing and hearing those names called out both hurts and also you don't want to not hear those names being called out and i'm just hearing the names for them as well as for myself i don't know if that's how you ever feel about it david but when you're calling out those names you're like you're 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 bringing back to life something and i think calling out names on and I think it's really important that people do do that, that they say so-and-so from so-and-so says this, so-and-so from so-and-so has joined us from here, you know, because you are actually involving and bringing people in. Yeah. That's my feeling of that. Rabbi David Ingbar, I showed this video at the summit that, that we were part of. Rabbi David Ingbar, I think, did a, just a magical job of this. I only saw it once, but I'm sure he does it often, where he... Um, he recognizes everyone who's in the sanctuary physically, and he recognizes everyone who's in the, the as he calls it, the zoomagog, um, which is just, it's, it's, it's just beautiful. By the way, I just wanted to mention, you talked before about um, how stressful last year was and rabbis and cantors having to, you know, use their own, set up the Zoom and all that other stuff. So many uh, people that I know of are schlepping their laptops in and out of the sanctuary to use this as streaming machines. So I want to make sure that anyone who's watching knows that at seven o'clock Eastern tonight on the hybrid ministries channel on Facebook, um, they're actually going to be talking about streaming computers and what is yeah. what you might want to consider. Um, I'm going to try and be there myself. I don't know if, if it's a little late for you. I don't know if you're going to try and be there, but, uh, I am, I am, I am beautiful. <laughs> so, yeah, so they're going to, that, that's going to be, if I know it's late for this year, but for, for, for the whole year, for every Shabbos, if you need to invest in any kind of streaming computer or dedicated streaming computer, those are the folks that are going to, and that's, that. that's a really a point that you said you may use, use if you use the high holy days as the springboard to get the equipment in that you're going to do there and that is every synagogue i've been involved in i've turned around to them and it's like do not buy equipment for high holy days buy equipment that you're going to use during the year maybe you're going to put it down in quotes to be used in the high holy days as the as your springboard but don't you know, I, I can't really get my head around spending a huge amount of money in a production company that only you use once for the right. for those, you know, for those services. And then they're gone and you go, look at that. We've got a DVD box set of uh, of the right. High Holy Days, because I, I think it's just not it's just, that's not going to create that long term thing, because I, I, I don't know my, my this is my prediction. I don't think it's really a difficult prediction. Every High Holy Days from today onwards or from this year onwards will be in some form or another for those synagogues which are already already streaming will continue to be streamed. Yeah. I cannot see anybody turning it off. I mean, right. by that, I realize that I am saying that 
that there are obviously there is uh, orthodox and there are certain conservative synagogues that aren't streaming or have you know i i can understand i'm not trying to make make that that difference what or, or or suggest anything that's wrong in that environment what i'm saying is those that have adopted it and now doing it will continue doing it and i guess that do you th where, what do you think david no, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, it's interesting, live control, which is, um, they also spoke at the summit, they're a service that basically are outsourcing the controlling and the switching of your service. So they take control of your PTZ cameras, or they give you PTZ cameras, and then they remote cut your show. And what's interesting is that people asked me originally, can I hire them just for the high holidays? And they don't do that. They have year-long the, the, the idea is that you hire them for the year because they want you to have a consistent experience, a consistent streaming experience long term, that it's not just about these high holidays. It is going to be about next high holidays and the ones after that and about all the Shabbatot that are in between. Um, and, and so I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Christo, thank you, by the way, Christo, for, for these amazing comments and everyone who's yeah, participating. Really good. Um, Selwyn says tradition. Uh, Christo says uh, he always asks people on Zoom to inform them if they have audio video problems. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, I imagine, so Christo, you're, if I understand correctly, you're not the clergy leader. You're sort of the Zoom clergy, if you will, the digital clergy. Um, that's another thing that I think synagogues will, or Jewish communities in general will need to start thinking about is do we need to have a, a dedicated person or dedicated people to run our online engagement, our online services, our online, you know, to, to help with those tech problems? Because it's not just the leaders that have the tech problems, it's participants also. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, do we yeah, need to... I, I've seen that. I, I saw a really good initiative by another synagogue near me. Um, and what they did is they were, they contacted uh, their members and said, you know, who's got problems trying to get this sorted out. Um, at the beginning when we ha couldn't visit, et cetera, et cetera, they were putting into a box uh, a very simple tablet along with a 4G modem and saying, okay, you know, this is it. We're going to provide you that. I would say now, if you were going to do that, you would you would give somebody a Facebook portal because it's right. far easier and it does everything that you need it to do. But it's it's that point of setting up and understanding, and saying I need to give you something that gets you in there. Um, and it was the same argument where you used to have large font uh, sidors, or you would have other things that you would yes. need just so that you get certain people. Or, the hearing, or ensure the, that the hearing device, hearing yeah. loop. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you fitted a hearing loop. Um, in fact, we have a nightmare at one place because one congregate's uh, hearing aid seems to set the whole sound system <laughs> off. <laughs> We're almost it's on the, the same frequency. It it it's on the same. Fre yeah, everybody else's changes. It's like you know, we really want to zap it, but that's not what we can do. Um, but it is really important that that the, the community, the congregation, the other members, the people that are not at the front, this is their opportunity to also step in, step in, help, get this, get this going. Because um, as we say, this isn't going to go away. And every year that it continues, that there are going to be more and more people in an, in a, and a more elderly generation is going to grow and grow and grow. Um, and we want you to be involved in this um, and witness what's happening as we talked about last time. Right. And it's, again, uh, it's, it, it, yeah. And, and again, it's, it's not going away and that's the depressing, sad, oh, we have to do this part. And here is this moment, right? Here is this opportunity. And there are people out there like Leo, like everyone in office hours, like me, who want to help you do it well and do it and, and, and get the most bang for your buck and give the best production value and use best practices because this is a moment and an opportunity. And um, I love sharing it with but you. It, but but so also from, from your perspective though, David, we've talked about, you know, sometimes you end up dwelling on the negatives. Um, 
maybe it's a Jewish tradition. Um, sure. but, still, but there's a lot, you know, but there's the positives. Um, out of all of the things that you've say, seen and talked about, what would you say you've seen is the positive things that you've actually seen that this, the opportunities that you've seen over the last year and a half that you are going to see, you're looking forward to seeing or continuing in, in the future? I'll give you one example. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, there is, yeah, I did. Here we go. So there's an Orthodox synagogue in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, and um, the rabbi there, there are three rabbis there. The rabbi there, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, uh, all three rabbis are amazing guys. And they started yep. a podcast called Behind the Bima. And this thing is huge. It's huge. They've had the Prime Minister of Israel on. They've had, I mean, look at all these. They had, let's see, um, Nahum Siegel, Charlie Harari from Aish, Ellie Beer from United Hatzalah. They've had the most amazing Robert Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, the most unbelievable guests on. It's all, uh, it's just a podcast that they do. I mean, now I, I don't know if he's using OBS or something. He's using something to make it look uh, really nice. They have graphics now and everything. This started as a way for these rabbis to kind of reach in a different way their community. There's an orthodox shul. And it's, it's just fantastic. It really, it, it's funny, it's informative, it's, it's learned. Um, and I can't imagine that they're going to, I hope they don't stop doing this. It's just fantastic. I love it. Uh, the, the, these are exactly, this is where I, I mean, I, I've got similar things is my exposure to thing, uh, people that I've met, particularly at um, Times of Israel, uh, people I've yeah. met around the world um, and seen things. Uh, the I did a global sukkah hop last year with United wow. Synagogue in the UK and they did it with the Commonwealth um uh, uh, the British Commonwealth synagogues and everywhere. And we went to some fabulous places. I didn't realize about synagogues in India. Yeah. I didn't know about yeah. the synagogues in some of the African countries and, and their sukkahs. And you're like looking at this and you're thinking, that's right. Oh, this has opened my eyes. I mean, obviously I knew there was like the ones in Australia and all of that, but you're looking at some of these things and you're going, this is fabulous i also did um a live music event with uh with with hungary with uh, art zena in hungary mm. and you're seeing these guys and you're like wow this is actually you know in quotes the old country coming back to life again in yeah. certain areas and it's particularly relevant with uh, the new synagogue opening in germany today or this week uh, mm. you know these things are coming back to coming around and you're seeing it. You're actually witnessing things which are, you may read about, but you're actually seeing them. And I think that's maybe something that this is enabling us to see and feel. Right. And the as access. you said earlier, yeah. access and do we have a connection with it, David? I guess that's yeah. what we've asked today is, do we have a connection with things that we see digitally? Um, and my gut feeling is, and from what I feel, my answer to the question you asked is uh, yes, we do. Yeah, it's certainly possible. It's certainly possible. All right, friends. Uh, thanks, Leo. Good Thank to you, see David. You. <laughs> I'll see you uh, in an so hour, I think. Right? I'll see you in an hour. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we will, yeah. and, and good luck for everybody who's planning for the High Holy Days. Um, and uh, 5782, here we come. Here we come. All right, everyone. Here we See you next time. Bye.